You are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair on RLM Radio. The girl of your dreams has got to be in some bar. Sorry, boys and girls, but this is X-rated. So if you're under 18... Get out, get out, get the point. Good. And now... Fendom. Y'all ready for this? We do it all night long. And now, your host, Grammy. Buckle up, children. It's going to get a little bit bumpy. Or at least it's bumpy out here. Holy smokes. At least the wind is cut in half. Whee! Got a ride going on. Y'all are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair here on RealLibertyMedia.com channel 3. Also on the RLM Radio.xyz side, RLM Spreaker channel, RLM TuneIn Radio Station, later to be on the RLM YouTube channel, and the RLM BitChute channel. So, hey, and God knows where else we're at. I'm sure I've forgotten several of them because I've walked through doorways since then. But... I do have to tell you this, over here on Twitter, number one, newsflash, be afraid, be very afraid. I have broken the 400 stalkers mark. (laughs) I now have 401 followers. (laughs) Oh, Lord, things could get scary. But... From Waking Warriors, did you know that it's entirely possible to disagree with both liberals and conservatives? It's called thinking for yourself, and we highly recommend it. Yes, we do. Critical thinking is not necessarily something that everyone is able to um, implement, shall we say, but... It is necessary if you want to be able to make it through the madness we call reality. Whee! It's fun. Um, Asshole tells another asshole, quit being a dick. (laughs) That's from The Onion. Oh, how funny. Okay. Let me see what this... Yeah. (laughs) I love it. Okay, so, in other words, I need to behave myself? Is that what that means? Mmm. I cut the wind. Well, okay. Uh, Rob, when I cut the wind, honey, that's rocket fuel. But. ba 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 Oh, the wind is actually blowing half as hard as it was last night. Last night, coming home from my mom's, we had 50 mile an hour crosswind. And 74 to someone else said it got up to 78 mile an hour gusts. So, yeah, it was a mess out here in western Kansas. And uh, a town just west of me, which is just right off the Colorado border, had to evacuate because of a fire and the dust storm. Uh, Couldn't get fire trucks to them, so they evacuated the town, which it's like, wow, how do you get people out of there when you can't see where the hell you're going? But that's pretty much what happened. And, yeah, yeah, last 20 miles of me getting home was... um, not real fun. There was intermittent can't see doodly shit. Like, you know, when you can't see the end of your uh, hood. Yeah, you know it's blowing pretty bad. So, in any case, but survived it. Because I'm here. Apparently, I rode out the storm. Maybe that's what I should have played. A little bit of REO Speedwagon. Oh, well. Too bad. I already played something else. So, And yes, there is a wild bunch here. So, uh, over here on Twitter. Hey there, thank you, Barman, for tweeting me out. And Gary L. Hey, Gary, thanks for tweeting me out. Truly do appreciate it. Over here on Fakie Book, uh, Miri B. is playing along, but not real sure who else is playing along. I see my dear friend Lisa B. is playing. Um, Over here on the Effin site. Thank you, Grimner, for sharing it over there on the Effin site. I also see uh, Mary B's been over here, as well as Cowboy Tech and the lovely Estrella. Hey, Estrella, you wild woman, you. And yeah, mm, I'm getting to the point where it's like, anytime I see anything about Assad or Syria, and I wonder if maybe that is the whole intent behind this shit, is I'm tired of seeing it. 
So therefore I scroll on by, and maybe that's the intent. Maybe I shouldn't be scrolling on by. Maybe I should be paying attention, because, yeah, you know, it's boy cried wolf syndrome. You just get to the point where it's like, hey. So, yes, Marcella, what is that? Oh, another person has been permanently banned from Twitter a few hours ago as a result of a neocon smear campaign. Ah, that's Ian56789 has been permanently banned. So, hey, Twitter, you're censoring. 1984 was not supposed to be a training manual. Eh, not that you give a shit, but hey. And, you know, speaking from the... um. Twitter side of the equation, they own the site. They're letting you play on there, and they make the rules. If you don't like the rules, leave. You know, that's kind of the way it works. Um, or you can rub their nose in it and then, you know, get kicked off and go, badge of honor, I got booted, because I had that badge of honor for a while there, and then I went back to fakie book, and I still can't get kicked off. What the hell? Maybe I will today. Or tonight, or tomorrow, never know. Something to look forward to. Oh, well. Uh, over here on Minds. Hey there, hi there, ho there, everybody on Minds. I forgot to get it shared over here, but I'm sure Grimmy did. Let me take a peek here at that Real Liberty Media. Um, just a sec. There it is. I'll just go ahead and click on that. And yeah, I'm live right now. It's scary, but yes, I am. Hey, be afraid. Let's see. Could get, yeah, yeah. We'll just do that. And now that I've done all of those, let's see, I've done Twitter, I've done Effin, I've done Facebook, I've done Minds. I guess I only have one place left to go. And that's where you need to be if you want to play along in the chat and give me static and all that other fun shit. Because, yeah, over here in the RLM. Come on over to reallibertymedia.com. Think of a nickname. Join the chat. Give everybody else some static. Voice your opinion. Just be prepared to get it back at you. That's just the way it works. And Rob Works has fired up the bubbler twice. So, yeah, people are getting a little bit wild and unruly over here. But, hey there, barman, right up top. Thank you, darling, for all you do. He is the most splendiferous bot in the whole wide world. And closely followed by Cowboy Tech. Yes, hi there, Cowboy. Hope you're hearing a pleasant voice. I see Grimner is here, too, and Grimmy is the RLM god, don't you know? As well as the lovely Moose Girl has joined us. Hey, Moosey, are you still getting blustered and snowed and all that fun stuff? Because the snow went away. It's drying a popcorn fart out here. We had a blizzard over the weekend, and now it's drier than a popcorn fart. Yeah, it's just, wow, crazy, crazy weather. And I got a link about that here in just a little bit. Actually, I think I've got a couple of them, but let's see here. Uh, the lovely Kate is here. Hey there, Kate. How you doing, hon? I, and I also see Asmo is here, Mr. Asmodeus. Yeah. Barman gives me... Th Thank you, Barman, for the static. <laughs> I really shouldn't do that because, yeah, I'll probably have that with my tin can and kite string. I also see the lovely Beth Z is logged in as well as Chalcedony. Got a double dip and a Chloe going on. Chloe, Chloe, just an echo. Yoo-hoo! And looky there, I'm here, as well as I be Don C and I be Don C Woik. And guess what, Don? Yes, thank you for that video earlier today. Yeah, I resembled that. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. Um, I also see Java, 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 Java. Doctor Two is in the house. Hey, Java, how you doing? And JJ's. I think I saw. No, that was from last night. JJ's is around. I see. I'm. Yeah. I. I stalk him, over on Twitter. Juana Taco is here as well. Oh, rub it in, Rob works. Rub it in. Yeah. Poo poo head. Seventy nine degrees. <laughs> oh well. The lovely Rain is in the chat. Hi, Rain. How are you doing, sweetheart? I also see RLM Fluke, who is just so damn awesome at letting us know what our weather is doing. And yeah. Oh, Moosey. Well, it's above freezing, hon. <laughs> 
Can't say a whole heck of a lot more than that, but you're above freezing. Yeah. My wind speed has slowed down to where it's less than what your temperature is. So I'm feeling very, very happy about that. Um, let's see. Where's I at? Rain. Fluky. Rob works. Who's the bubbler dude? Thanks, dude, for the bubbler. I also see trust. No one is in the house. Hey, you trusty feller. And Dakota. As well as Dima and Frumpy. Yeah, Frumpy. Yeah, that's what I think, too. <laughs> I also see Kozu is in the house, as well as Moy, 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 Moy. And Ninsan Dubois is logged in, as well as Poxified and Poxy Home. We also have Pop Upon Sauce, and to round out the crew, the one, the only, the Phantom of the RLM. <laughs> Let's see what my notifications are over here. Oh, thank you ever so much, Jeff and Cowboy Tech. I appreciate that. Yeehaw! EPIA Cow Patty. Now, where do I want to go? <laughs> I got told where to go yesterday. It was really quite fun. It's by my mother, too, of all people. And I laughed, and I laughed, and she said, what are you laughing about? And I said, you just told me where to go. And she said, I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I love picking on her. I mean, crap, she's damn near 87 years old, you know? And she's got one hell of an attitude. That woman is just, she's just amazing. She really is. She putters around the yard, you know, unless it's like below freezing. She's outside, and she's puttering, and she's doing things. She's just, she's the bomb. That's just all there is to it. Don't piss her off either, because she could hurt you. Still, she's got every damn one of us still scared. So, Okay, let's see. I'm going to go ahead and close Twitter because, yeah, that picture of Arnold Schwarzenegger head in with apples. No, that was just one too far. Can't go there. Okay. Um, da -da, da -da, da -da. Where was I at? Citizens. No, no, not that one yet. Not yet. Okay, how about we go with this is from realclimatescience.com. How's that sound? Um, I think I also have something else. Yeah, I do there. Okay, so 30 years of the James Hansen Clown Show. Booyah! Climate fraud and all kinds of other fun stuff. Yeah, this is the Deplorable Science, uh, Deplorable Climate Science blog, by the way. And it's from today. So, it's been 30 years since CO2 hit 350 parts per million. And NASA's James Hansen warned that the Midwest was going to burn up and dry up. Okay, it is drier than a popcorn fart, but that's because frickin' wind is blowing like crazy. If Oklahoma would quit sucking, it wouldn't be so bad. <laughs> Or maybe if Nebraska would quit blowing. I don't know. I'm between a couple of windy-ass states. That's just all there is to it. So, Hansen predicted heat and drought for the Midwest 30 years ago, and they have had above-normal precipitation almost every year, which, yes, we have, actually. But, you know, the wind is supposed to be in March, and then April is supposed to bring flower or showers so that May will have flowers. But y'all are kind of off-kilter. You're about a month off on all of this crap. Also, maximum temperatures and the occurrences of heat waves in the Midwest have plummeted to record lows. Now, this is from, um, let's see, it takes the average maximum temperature versus year from 1895 to 2017. And uh, right now, our average temperature is just a little above 60 degrees. The hell? the hell and the percent of days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit from 1895 to 2017 in the Midwest yeah um, the percentage of days right now coming up to into 2017 is right around 3% of the days above 90 degrees yeah it's really hard to get stuff like uh, tomatoes and those kind of things that really require some heat to finish ripening up. Yeah, kind of difficult to get that shit done when it's still cold. Hansen predicted that global warming would lower the water levels of the Great Lakes as well. 
Yeah, apparently this is from the Miami News, the uh, 24th of June, 1988. At the same time, heat would cause inland waters to evaporate more rapidly, thus lowering the levels of bodies of water such as the Great Lakes. Um, the point at which the warming will be apparent has been described as the greenhouse signal, which Hansen acknowledged in an interview following his testimony that he was laying claim to having detected that greenhouse signal. That's exactly what he's saying. But the Great Lakes water levels are near record highs. Hmm, I wonder if maybe he was just having one of those opposite day moments for like a opposite day Groundhog Day thing for several years. Apparently the Midwest is having their coldest April on record as well. So far from April 1st to April 15th, the average maximum temperature from uh, 1895 to 2018, they can do that now because yeah, it's we've, we're past the 15th. And the average maximum temperature for 2018 is 45 degrees. Yeah, where is this global warming? Obviously, the download of spring failed. Michigan gives James Hansen a big thumbs up for promoting some of the well, blah, 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 some of the worst junk science ever dreamed up. Cause yeah, yeah, snow. Snow, and this climate prophet, yeah, he made a profit off of it, that's for damn sure. He predicted that the Arctic would be ice-free and lower Manhattan would be underwater by this year. Well, honey, you ain't no Nostradamus. Someone needs to write a song. You ain't no Nostradamus. You're welcome. Also, James Hansen has an incredible record of misprediction on junk science, which is why Democrats love him so much. Yeah, because to his credit, he did get one thing right. James Hansen, father of climate change awareness, calls Paris talks a fraud. Huh. Well, yeah, because you have all these people telling us that we need to cut back on our CO2 emissions and you're flying in jets over to Paris to party and schmooze and discuss with people that believe the same nonsense that you believe and I'm not saying that there hasn't been climate change going on because quite it's pretty obvious that there has been a change a going on but y'all keep saying that it's man-made well I will also acknowledge that if you quit spraying us with your frickin aerosols you know your your airplane dis or dispersers of uh, raid yeah y'all could cut that shit out I would really be happy yeah moose oh yeah and you know what my mother has been she has spent more money this year on bird food because yeah it sucks oh well let's see okay who's this oh they're making big deal of that dead woman in local media. Oh, since she was from Albuquerque? Mm. It is sad. That is sad that someone had to... But you know what? Anything made by man is bound to break. That's just, just the way it works. Nothing is permanent in this physical realm, except for energy. You cannot kill energy. It just converts to another form. But, uh, yeah... Everything else has an expiration date. It's just most of them, most things, the expiration date is within three months after the warranty runs out. <laughs> they don't tell you that, though, because we do live in a, a disposable society these days. They just don't, and quite seriously, they just don't make things like they used to. You know, washers and refrigerators and all that shit used to last for 30 years. But now they've got all these fancy goo and gadgets and electronics and all this other fun stuff. And if you listen to Larry Woods, they are not tuned properly to the right frequency. They're not operating on the right frequency. And so, so therefore, they are designed to break down. 
because how are you going to have people to continue to purchase your product if you don't if everybody buys one and then well, I don't need a new one this one works just fine sure it's 30 years old but it works just fine I see cars on the road <laughs> that are older than 30 years but okay we'll just do this one uh, da, da. Now, seeing as how he was doing all this wonderful, you know, um, looking back, a look back at history. Let's look back at something else in history, shall we? Um, yes, that would be an absolutely horrible way to go, Grim. Absolutely horrid, which is part of the reason why I am i don't complain a whole hell of a lot when I don't get a window seat. But I do kind of like to watch what's going on so I know if we're going down then I can get in the aisle and start flapping my arms keep the plane up keep the plane up okay yeah that would be oy. Oy. okay this is from worldtruth.tv and they asked the question did ancient people really have lifespans longer than 200 years well you know there are some people that uh, really do live I saw one local person celebrating her 100th birthday um, over the weekend so that's halfway there so it isn't only biblical figures who lived to well seasoned ages of 900 years or more ancient texts from many cultures have listed lifespans most modern people find simply and literally unbelievable and some say it's due to misunderstandings in the translation process or that the numbers have symbolic meaning. But against the many explanations are also counter arguments that leave the historian wondering whether the human lifespan has actually decreased so significantly over thousands of years. And it could quite possibly have. Could have. For example, one explanation is that the ancient Near East understanding of a year could be different than our concept of a year today. Just like when they say in the Bible that God created the world in seven days, how do you know one of his days ain't a million years for us? Just putting that out there. You know, uh, a couple, 48 hours to a tsetse fly is a lifetime. Uh, unless you squash it. <laughs> Oops. So, um, perhaps a year meant an orbit of the moon or a month, which I think that's a little, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but eh, that's just my opinion, instead of an orbit of the sun, which is 12 months. But if we make the changes accordingly, while it brings the age of the biblical figure Adam down to 930, or from 930 to a more reasonable 77 at the time of his death, it also means that he would have fathered his son Enoch at the age of 11. Damn! And Enoch would have only been five years old when he fathered Methuselah. Similar inconsistencies arrive when, when we uh, adjust the year figures to represent seasons instead of solar orbits. This is from Carol A. Hill that she noted in her article, Making Sense of the Numbers of Genesis. So, similar problems have arisen when adjusting age to ancient texts with the assumption that authors used a certain pattern for skewing the actual ages, such as multiplying them by a given number, or, um, let's see, whatever, yes, I see a flashing. What? Gary Elstrand, what? Okay, wait, huh? What? What do you do? Oh. Yes, that, that JFK to 9-11, everything is a rich man's trick, that is a, wow, that is definitely an eye-opener that makes you, that's some brain food that will make you go, hmm. And you know, once you once you realize the lie, you know that someone has, uh, told you a falsehood doesn't it pretty much call everything that they say to you into question so yeah 
Yes, Grimmy, they must have been horny little bastards if they're fathering children at five. But moving along, so the mathematical patterns in this. In both Genesis and in the 4,000-year-old Sumerian Kings list, which lists the reigns of single kings in Sumer, which is ancient southern Iraq, as exceeding 30,000 years in some cases, analysts have noted the use of square numbers. Much like the Bible, the King's List shows a steady decline in lifespans. Yeah, that's because, you know, um, the Nephilim came here and they found the, the human female, the woman, comely, <laughs> pun intended if you wish it to be. And, um, yeah, you know, you start getting... Uh, God's intermingling with males and females, and I would assume that, you know, gods have longer lifespans, and I am talking about gods with a small g, by the way, but, um, yeah, as they start procreating with more men and women, not the small g gods, then uh, the lifespan would shorten. Plus, you know, those damn humans, they're always dirtying up the, oil, the air and all that fun stuff, so... Um, what's that? Oh, okay. Yes, and yes, Enoch did leave on a spaceship. But, <coughs> yeah, he was one of the first joyriders on a UFO. So we're told. Okay, so, back to this. Um, much like the Bible, the King's List shows a steady decline in lifespans. The list differentiates between pre-flood and post-flood rains. The pre-flood rains are significantly longer than the post-flood. Obviously, somebody left the water running and, yeah. So, um, even post-flood lifespans are shown to be several hundred years or more. Or, yeah, some of them are... Uh, Several hundred years or more than 1,000 years. Yeah, read it right, Grams. Yoinks. So in the Bible, we see a progressive decline over the generations from Adam's 930-year life to Noah's 500 years to Abraham's 175 to my mom planning to be 126 to Dwight... <laughs> <laughs> but apparently Dwight Young of Brandy's University wrote in the post-flood lifespans in the Sumerian Kings list, it is not merely because of their largeness that some of these numbers appear artificial. Atanya's uh, 1,560 years, to cite the longest, is but the sum of two preceding reigns. Really, that's still an extensive lifespan. Certain spans seem simply to have arisen as multiples of 60. Other large numbers may be recognized as squares, like 900 is the square of 30. Okay, yeah, do your magic math. Do your magic math. Why can't you just take it as it's written? No. Oh, there's no way, because those people couldn't have had technology. They couldn't have lived better than we did. They couldn't have had longer lifespans. Life they couldn't have been healthier than us, because we're so advanced. We have technology. Yeah. Right. Um, 625 is the square of, two, of 25. 400 is the square of 20. Even among smaller figures, the square of 6 appears to be more frequent frequently than one might expect. Young's article titled A Mathematical Approach to Certain Dynastic Spans in the Sumerian Kings List. So, yeah, they they went to the trouble of putting this in stone to say, okay, be prepared for your first F-bomb tonight. We're going to fuck with the people several thousand years down the road. We're going to put this shit in here so it looks like we live for thousands of years. Man, they're going to be scratching their heads. They're going to be arguing with each other. We will keep them distracted for years. God. And we'll be watching from the pearly gates going, <laughs> dumbasses. Sure. Mm-hmm. Okay. Apparently, uh, Paul Y. Paul Y. Hoskison, who is the director of the Laura F. Wiles Center 
for Book of Mormon Studies wrote that along a similar vein of the patriarch ages in the Bible, in a short article uh, for Neil A. Wax or Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship. And on the other hand, looking at patterns, co-founder of the Church of God in South Texas, Arthur Mendez, thinks the rate of decline in longevity from pre-flood times, as recorded in ancient texts, to today matches the rate of decay observed in organisms when they are exposed to radiations or toxins. Huh, and maybe just maybe we are getting radiated a little bit more, and uh, it's really pretty obvious that we have a lot more toxins to deal with these days. But if you take the accounts of other cultures as well, in ancient China, supercentarians were also commonplace according to many texts. Um, da -da -da -da. okay, there's a doctor who's an acupuncturist who wrote a book, Healthy Longevity Techniques, and according to Chinese medical records, a doctor named Kui Huens of the uh, Yin Dynasty lived to be 300 years old. Ji Yul of a later Han Dynasty lived to be 280 years old. And a high-ranking Taoist master monk, He Zhao, lived to 290 years old. And Lo Zichang lived to be 180 years old. As recorded in the Chinese Encyclopedia of Materia Medica, He Nin... Okay, yeah. He Nin Ji. I'm sure I'm butchering these. Of the Tang Dynasty. Hey, they had Tang back then. Cool. I thought that was just for astronauts. <laughs> oh, well, from the Tang Dynasty, he lived to be 168 years old, and a Taoist master, Li Qingyang, lived to be 250 years old. In modern times, a traditional Chinese medicine doctor, Lo Mingshan of Sihuan province, lived to be 124 years old, and Dr. Ho said the eastern key to longevity is nourishing life, including not only physical nourishment, but also mental and spiritual nourishment. Yes, what you feed your brain, you know, if you keep feeding your brain, you keep taking in brain food that comes at you from the propaganda trough, and you wash it down with several cups of fool aid, obviously you are going to be a foolish propagandist. So... Because you are what you eat. You are what you consume. Okay, there is another uh, Book of Kings. And it's a Persian epic poem that was written around the end of the 10th century AD. And it tells of kings reigning 1,000 years, several hundred years, down to 150 years, and so on. But that can't be true. That can't be right. They couldn't have done that way back in them days because they, they didn't have modern medicine and doctors and the AMA. All they had was natural things like plants that we now make illegal. <laughs> Wait a minute here. I think we should go back to the plants. Oh, well. Now, for the modern claims of longevity, even today people report lifespans of some 150 or more years. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Grimmy. I didn't know that. Wow, how cool. I didn't know Tang had a daughter named Poon. <laughs> okay. So... There is documentation um, that's probably even less valued in rural, rural communities more than a century ago, making it harder to prove such claims, but, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, one example is Bir uh, Narayan Chaudhry. Okay, he is in Nepal. And in 1996, Vijay Hyung Thapa visited this person in Tharu village in the Tarav region. And I'm 
butcher and man why do I always pick these and he was told that the gentleman was 141 years old he wrote an article for India today and if this claim is true um, Chadhari Trump the Guinness world record holder for the longest life ever recorded by almost 20 years damn and they there is a photograph here too so Chaudhry didn't have the papers to prove it. He did, however, have collective village memory. Almost all the elders around remember their youth when Chaudhary, already an elder, would talk about working in the first Nepal survey in 1888. Village logic goes that he must have been more than 21 then since the survey was a responsible job and he claims to have been 33 and still a stubborn bachelor. Wow. Many people in the Caucasus uh, region of, I know I said that wrong, of Russia similarly claim ages reaching over 170 years without the documentation to back up their claims. Well, you know, it's no big deal because Popo uh, Dangleberry didn't have proper documentation either, so, you know, and he was Popo for eight years. Dr. Howell wrote that these exceptionally long-lived people have invariably lived humble lives doing hard physical work or exercise, often outdoors, from youth well into old age. Their diet is simple, as is their social life involving families. Um, one example is Shisali Mislinlo, who lived to be 170 years old and gardened in, the, in some region in Russia. Azerbaijan, apparently Mislinlo's life was never hurried. He said, I am never in a hurry, so don't be in a hurry to live. That is the main idea. And I've been doing physical labor for 150 years. Wow. And there is a photo of this gentleman taken in 1970. And he looks pretty spry for an old guy. So, is it a matter of faith? The issue of longevity in ancient times has long been connected to a Taoist practice of internal alchemy, or mind-body cultivation, in China. Here, longevity was connected with virtue. Likewise, it is intertwined with Western spiritual beliefs as part of the Bible. Mendes quoted a first-century Roman Jewish historian Titus Flavus Josephus, now, when Noah had lived 350 years after the flood, but let no one, upon comparing the lives of the ancients with our lives and with the few years which we now live, think that what we have said of them is false, or make the shortness of our lives at present an argument that neither did they attain to so long a duration of life for those ancients were beloved of God and yet yeah, probably had a lot less radiation getting in. And lately, m ooh, made by God himself. Uh-huh, uh, what did I say? Yeah. And because their food was then fitter for a pro prolongation of life, might well live so great a number of years. And besides, God afforded them a longer time of life on account of their virtue and the good use that they made of it. So for now, modern scientists are left either to believe what ancient records and village memory have to say about seemingly unbelievable lifespans, or to consider the accounts exaggerations, symbolisms, or misunderstandings. For many, it's simply a matter of faith. And you know what? Every time they, they talk down on ancient cultures and ancient civilizations and you stop and you look at some of the things that they accomplished that we can't do now with our supposed quote unquote modern technology yeah I'm thinking they probably lived a hell of a lot longer than us simply because they weren't such 
maybe they weren't as many. Of course, there was an awful lot of begatting going on back there, if you believe the Bible. Ooh, what's that? Rothschild names successor to his empire. And who would that successor be? Hmm? Um, oh, goodness. Okay, I'm going to put this over here on this effing site as well. Just because it's like, wow. Wow. Them people got really, really old. And... You know, I've not I've seen some people who are pretty freaking spry for old people. You know, or what I I look at as old people because they're twice my age, but that don't necessarily mean that. Yeah, because I still think my mother could probably work circles around me if she really wanted to. I think she could. I know my grandpa could outrun me when when he was ninety two. I know he could. But. Yeah. And he lived to 98, I believe. So. Oh, oh, go on, Grimmy. I see this over here on the effing site. Go on. Okay. Now I'm going to go back to my pocket. Because I do have a couple other things. Um, let's see. Where... Do I want to go here? Um, I may have already done that one. So, um, okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Since I'm on the ancient thing. <coughs> Excuse me. Darn. Dust in the wind. Yeah. <laughs> no shit. This is from ancientcode.com. The Earth Grid are ancient monuments the result of global consciousness. Hmm. So, not only did they have uh, a grid, and they have way cool things that we're so dumb are archaeologists either either we're dumb or they really think we're dumb no those circles that have little connecting lines that are all over South Africa though they had a lot of cows and those cows well although they couldn't jump over the moon this was probably what got that nursery rhyme started because they would jump over those high walls and get in there and sleep overnight because it was safe from the wild beasties that couldn't jump those high walls, just the cows could, because they were magic and shit. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, in addition to the fact that Earth is so far the only planet capable of hosting life as we know it, many other mysteries engulf our home world. Throughout millennia, ancient civilizations around the globe left their mark on history building supermassive structures that defy explanation. Our ancestors made sure to remain ever-present in history books. Probably back there going, you know, people, a thousand years from now, going to be scratching their head and scratching their ass and going, how in the hell did they do that shit? Magic! Today we admire and research awe-striking monuments built thousands of years ago trying to answer some of the most important historical questions. How did civilization develop? How they managed to transport massive stones weighing up to 100 tons? And why so many monuments are similar in design? Must have been just one designer, but he just went all over the world, you know, because it's just in great demand. So, what if there was a higher purpose to these ancient structures? What if? Hmm. Well, yeah, like an energy grid. But perhaps the most critical question we have failed to address is, is it possible that ancient monuments were built with a higher purpose? And what if these striking structures were constructed not randomly, but were strategically positioned around the globe? 
Have you ever noticed that some ancient monuments appear to be connected? And if you take a look at a world map and look at the positions of ancient monuments, you'll notice that some of them can easily be connected with straight lines, almost as if the ancient builders used advanced forms of geometry and mathematical equations carved into stone making already mind-boggling monuments even more mysterious. Yeah, because it was magic and they did it to appease their gods because we can't admit that they were smarter than us. Arrogant pricks. <clears throat> Many authors have asked and failed to answer why the pyramids of Egypt were built. I think they're great big batteries, and somebody took the capstone off, and if you put that damn capstone back on there, Whoa, dude, we wouldn't need oil or wind or solar or anything because Mother Earth would generate her own. She's already generating her own, but we would be able to actually use it. But we can't, we can't know that stuff because we're just dumb oomans. According to those that go to the ivy, ivory towers of Educraption, at least. Furthermore, we have failed to answer how the ancient Egyptians... Um, built these massive monuments or and how they were erected and we have not managed to understand how the ancient Egyptians managed to place the great <coughs> excuse me the great pyramid of Giza at the exact center of all landmass on earth dude that's impressive so did you know that the east-west parallel that crosses the most land and the north-south meridian that crosses the most land intersect in two places on the earth. One in the ocean and the other at the Great Pyramid. I did not know that. So, don't you wonder how this was possible without the ability to fly? Maybe they did fly. Maybe they were able to hover like bumblebees do. So, how did the ancients manage this without the ability to know how the world land masses looked like at that time? The pyramids, specifically those around Giza, are an amazing achievement of several sciences together. Geometry, physics, and mathematics all combined to form monuments that have stood the test of time. For example, the weight of the Great Pyramid of Giza is estimated, now mind you, estimated at 5,955,000 tons, or 955,000 tons. That's one heavy some bitch. Now you multiply uh, by 10 to the 8th, and it gives you a reasonable estimate of the Earth's mass. Okay, I'll take your word for that for now. So if we were to recreate the Great Pyramid of Giza today, we would have difficulties doing so despite our knowledge and machinery. This fact alone makes the Pyramids of Giza a true ancient marvel. But we don't want to take away credit from the ancient man who built some incredible structures like the pyramids, but did they really manage this with sticks and stones? I don't. They probably had stones, but they had resonance stones. Okay, Michael Tellinger has infected my brain. So, or did they, as some authors suggest, possess far more advanced technology than we are willing to accept? I, I'll go with door number three, or two, or whatever. I can't help but wonder if there's a slight chance that somehow ancient cultures all over the world were connected, mm -hmm. either through a global consciousness or another global phenomenon that helped, them, helped point them in the single direction, which resulted in the construction of countless ancient sites that look alike as if it was a construction process on a global scale, which <clears throat> would not surprise me one dang bit. I mean, it's just basically aesthetics that make things look different. You know, some are a little bit more stylized in one way than another. Almost as if every single structure on our planet felt the need to place mon or not structure, every single culture. Yeah, read it right, Grams. 
um, felt the need to place monuments such as the pyramids, the Stonehenge, Teo, uh, Teotihuacan, and other incredible places in specific locations. Why did they pick those locations? Are those magnetic power points? Is that what those are? I'm curious. What these ancient civilizations did was create a pattern, a pattern that we today are identifying and connecting, forming a massive puzzle, piece by piece. Many authors wonder if it is possible that many ancient monuments were not placed randomly. Oh, I don't think they were placed randomly. I think the people that were smart enough to build those things put them where they would do the most good for them. Each one of them, I think, had a purpose, and it wasn't, we're going to go kill some virgin shit. Some authors are convinced that that embedded in the megalithic constructions, there lies a secret code that can explain how, why, or who built and organized these incredible monuments that are scattered across the planet. The more we research ancient civilizations and their history, culture, and knowledge, the more surprised we are. Uh huh. The more we find, the more we understand how little we know. And that is a blessing. You know, the more you study, the more you realize how little you actually know, because the more questions you have, and it's like, whoa, these people were really freaking smart. So, what if the ancient Egyptians did not place the pyramids randomly? What if pyramids, temples, and tombs were marked a specific geographic location? And what if other civilizations around the globe did the same? What if civilizations in the Americas and Asia did the same? What if all ancient sites were built with a plan? A lot of what ifs there, and that's just the tip of that iceberg. Researchers have discovered connections between sacred structures and powerfully charged areas of the globe where the Earth's electromagnetic energy accumulates. Hmm. These locations were important and held meaning to the ancients. But how did the ancients know of these geographic locations? Well, ancient astronaut theorists points towards the so-called world grid or the earth grid, and this theory maintains that ancient civilizations around the globe purposely constructed their monuments on energy lines that when mapped and connected create a significant pattern, as if when connected they form a sort of energy web, which, yeah, I don't doubt it one dang bit. That's probably why they lived longer, too because they didn't have all the dang pollution that we're putting out there. They didn't go down that road. The whole idea of the world grid is that the Earth is like a huge crystal where the energy flows around through little nodules. Energy paths intersect and move all over the world. In fact, before the ancient astronaut theory came into existence thousands of years ago, an ancient Greek philosopher took the first steps to identify specific locations on Earth. Plato was one of the first to propose the basic structure of Earth evolved from geometric shapes now known as Pla uh, Platonic solids. Huh. What Plato did was extremely interesting because he described the Earth as being created from 12 pentagonal faces and 20 vortices on the surface. Ah, cool. Well, I didn't know that. So, when you take all of them, join them, and go on the map and mark them, you realize that there are geometrical formations that appear among them. Everything becomes connected. In fact, Plato wrote that there was a world soul, which he described as a sphere that was composed of 120 equal identical triangles. And some researchers and scientists today believe that this could be applied to the Earth. It is possible that hidden in these patterns is a secret energy source. Yeah, 
it is. It's, not, it's secret because somebody's keeping it secret because they're having too damn much fun making the rest of us work our asses off. Earn a living instead of just living. What the hell? Who started that shit? I'd like to drop kick them through the goalposts of life. Apparently, or did they have a form of technology that could have helped the ancient civilizations build these monuments? I think so, although our definition of technology and theirs were probably light years apart. The proof that the earth grid actually exists and that we can harness energy from. Yeah, I think there is proof. And thanks to our advanced science and technology today, which I think is a lot of it is based on theories that are false, but once you have that theory and you want to prove it right, you can come up with all kinds of fun little stuff and mathematic equations to prove it. Prop up that theory. Thousands of years ago, how could the ancients have known this? And if they did know about certain frequencies and energies, did they really build monuments to maybe harness certain energies? I think so. So what we see today is evidence of a higher consciousness present in ancient civilizations. I believe that is so as well. Gee, now I just had this pop into my head. Go with me on this. So it's like I watched, I binge watched the, the Netflix Lost in Space over the weekend. And at 2 in the morning I had to quit. There was like two shows left, but I had to quit because I was pissed. <laughs> said, that's not the way it ended in the original TV show. Blah, 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 blah. And it was 2 in the morning and I was tired. So, but I, I binge watched. And, you know, you had these colonists and they were going to Alpha Centauri and they were going to colonize Alpha Centauri and yada, 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 blah, blah, blah. But they had this one Dr. Smith. Now, one Dr. Smith was playing all of these different people off of each other. And now the connection I'm making here wait, go with me on this, <laughs> is that pre-flood, post-flood. So we had some kind of cataclysm going on. Pre-flood, the Dr. Smiths were outnumbered, and people knew who the Dr. Smiths were, and they called their bullshit and didn't put up with their bullshit. After the flood, you had a couple of Dr. Smiths that lived, <clears throat> and the Dr. Smiths started playing each other off of each other. And those Dr. Smiths actually knew how some of this shit really worked. And they worked it to their advantage so that they could not have to work. Everyone else would have to do the work. And they would say, I know how to do this. It's just, it's a theory. I mean, what the hell? Everybody else puts out crazy ass theories. Why not mine? So, um, if it is as it or it is as if ancient civilizations knew that they placed their monuments in specific locations that they could connect to so that they call or the so-called energy grid and many ancient cultures believed that everything would come into flow and if they placed their monuments on specific planned locations which maybe they did maybe it worked for them and maybe the reason why we don't see it is because we're too busy going they was just stupid people way back there they didn't have what we call civilization and they they had big old phallic symbols because yeah apparently these days archaeologists are really really you know focused on phallic symbols for some stupid reason. <sighs> but really, this was uh, practiced by almost all ancient color cultures that we know of, from the Mayans to the ancient Egyp Egyptians to civilizations in Mesopotamia and in Asia. Yes. Hiya, Chloe. Oh, that's way cool. Um, oh, Alex Jones is just freaking nuts. He's just nuts. He's gone off the deep end. Apparently, he started really believing all of his press. Hi, you, Chloe. And, uh, Start thinking, you know, he's one of them, them there, Dr. Smiths, maybe. 
Thanks, Rob Works. That looks rather interesting. I think I'll go there. Um, let me share this over here on F on site real quick. And you know, there's all kinds of things that we can do without, you know, Mother Earth gave us all the tools that we needed to keep ourselves healthy and to clothe ourselves and all that other fun stuff. But we, we lost that connection somewhere along the way. And yes, I'm still reading my Anastasia Ringing Cedar series. I don't get a whole lot done when I go to bed and read it for a little bit and hopefully not have it fall on my nose. Actually, it won't fall on my nose now because I have to hold it far enough away that the book won't reach my nose, but that, that's beside the point. So, um, let me check this out. Thank you, Rob Works, for this one. From thr from the trenches world report dot com. Company develops a revolutionary way to create leather, wood, and bricks from mushrooms. So it's not just hemp that they can do this with, and it's not just the plastics that we are filling up our oceans and landfills and all that other fun stuff that we can do this with. You can also do it with mushrooms. And yes, we do have the animal kingdom, we have the plant kingdom, and we have the fungi kingdom. They are three different kingdoms, three different life source kingdoms, if you will. So, in a world where the average person consumes more resources than could possibly be generated in their lifetime, there is no surprise to hear that our quickening resource consumption is resulting in a slow motion collapse of the environment and all the life on the planet. I don't doubt that one bit because we are such a lovely little throwaway society. We need to stop that. <laughs> However, <clears throat> Excuse me. Researchers at a San Francisco-based startup company have discovered a way to counteract this degradation. MycoWorks, M-Y-C-O Works, W-R-K-S, is a company which creates products out of fungi. They're such fun guys. And believes that the answer may lie in replacing just some of the many products we consume with this entirely sustainable and renewable source material. Much like hemp, only hemp is from the plant kingdom and fungus is its own because it's not really a plant and it's not really an animal. It's somewhere in between. So <clears throat> they can take our greatest resources, which is human waste, and turn that into something that's really valuable to us. They have the ability to give us everything that we want. This is from Philip Ross, Chief Technology Officer at Myco Works. So, soon you could be wearing shit for clothes. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, this could get interesting. <clears throat> the company currently has the ability to create material which is similar to animal skin, but even sturdier than leather. They were able to create products which are more durable than deer skin in only a matter of months. But what is perhaps most encouraging about the project is that the material only takes two weeks to create. Whereas real leather takes about two years for the animal to be ready without considering the cost of feeding and housing. Yeah, and then the animal's got to be made naked. Well, usually the animal doesn't live. Okay. Ain't no usually. Animal don't live through that process. On the contrary, mushroom-based products are entirely cruelty-free and can be created from any number of waste materials such as hemp, herds, paper waste, sawdust, and corn cobs. They're not just for wiping your ass. Old redneck joke. So, by feeding mushrooms, particularly things that they like, um as well as managing temperature and light exposure, these scientists are able to create various breathable materials which theoretically could replace cloth, leather, and even wood and brick. Yes. Um, that's true, Grim. That is true. 
they would be shitting bricks. <laughs> well, part of the process. <laughs> so, um, being more resilient than brick and less flammable than wood, this material would naturally work well for building. I wonder how well it would stand up to uh, earthquakes as well. Or donators. Hmm. Eventually, Philip and other scientists believe that it will be possible to produce smartphones, solar panels, and a whole plethora of other products from waste material and mushrooms. Got a shit phone, dude. <laughs> yeah, I know. Cost next to nothing, too. Yeah, it may be shit, but it didn't cost that much. <laughs> I got a shit phone now. Okay, moving along. So, everything that we call agricultural waste is actually an incredible resource that mushrooms can grow on. We're past peak oil, so if we're going to replace our current materials with something, it's still going to have to hold up to some type of sustainable way, which I'm sure somebody's going to step in and say, we're from the government and we're not here to help. By the way, that invention you have there, that is a threat to our national security. Why is it a threat to our national security? Petrodollar, that's why. You came up with it, we're going to seize it. Thank you very little, move along, or you will die in a very mysterious manner, and you will have a suicide note. Isn't that the way it usually works? So, if you're interested in growing your own material from mushrooms, you can do so by following their guide in a short YouTube video. Theoretically, you could start building your own products from mushrooms right away. It's even possible to embed intricate colors and patterns directly into the material, if you know how. You know, it's kind of like in, incorporating uh, paint into your concrete as you're pouring a concrete floor. It's kind of cool. So, MycoWorks, after having debuted in 2016 with their plan to create enough mushroom material to sustain the growing industry, is still in operation today. Booyah! And continues to reach thousands of people with their message. With enough demand for local produced or locally produced and sustainable materials, the future of consumer goods could turn from an environmental blight back to a sustainable way that we can move forward into the future. Oh, but damn it, that would make it to where people are less reliant on corporate America and government and banks and corp... Wow, we just can't have this. That's a threat to national security. Thank you, Rob Works. That is pretty freaking awesome. It really is. That's like major two scoops of way cool covered in awesome sauce is what that is. So. Oh, I forgot to paste my link. <laughs> I am such a dork. Oy. <clears throat> Did I copy it? <laughs> yes, life is good when you're not having brain farts. Which is probably why it's so windy. Moving along. Thank you once again, Rob Works. So, how about we go with this one? Because, yeah, you can use shrooms, you can have shit phones, you can have shit clothes, you can, you can have a shit house. Literally. But, here's some shit. This is some serious shit now. This is from an theantimedia.com. Cop who was fired for not writing enough tickets finally speaks out. Now, there is a video attached to this, but a police officer in Alpharetta, Georgia, claims that he was fired for not issuing enough traffic tickets to motorists in the area. Officer Daniel Capps was on the force for nine years and was ultimately terminated because he declined to issue a traffic ticket to a driver after he bumped into another car. According to the department memo directed at officers, if there is an accident with any damage that needs to be fixed with more than a little wax and elbow grease, you need to write a citation, even if there are no injuries and the damage is minor. 
So as long as officers are called to the scene of a car accident, this rule is supposed to apply. But Caps decided to let the motorist who caused the minor incident off with a warning. Someone's already needing to pay the insurance. It's hassle. There's no need to have a ticket on top of that, he told the local outlet CBS 46, adding that he dis, uh, doesn't believe it's a police officer's job to make people's lives miserable. Well, it's no wonder he's no longer a cop. Um, so, um, he said that when Caps... Okay. According to Charles Westover, who rear-ended the driver in front of him at a slow speed, to have a blanket policy that applies to all kinds of incidents doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And he said that when Caps arrived at the scene, he was extremely courteous, very professional, acknowledging it was a minor fender bender and there was no need to issue a ticket. Sadly, insurance companies will say, well, if there's no ticket issued, then it's no fault and nobody has to cover. Yeah. Insurance companies play that both ends of the scale, too. According to Cap's police report, report, no one was injured, and only the bumpers of the car were damaged. The person whose car was hit did not object to Cap's decision to not to write a citation. <clears throat> I was pretty appalled, and am appalled. That doesn't seem right to put that kind of a mark on a gentleman's life, Westover said. CBS 46 attempted to obtain comment from Police Chief John Robson, but he did not reply. Caps, who says he, was, he issued a lot of warnings as an officer, expanded on his views, suggesting that the policy is the work of the single city supervisor. Or single city supervisor. He's just one of those guys who likes writing tickets. He just gets off on, in their words, causing other people pain. I wasn't like that. I gave a lot of warnings. If someone needed a ticket, they would get one. If they were courteous and understood what they did wrong, I would write a citation. Same thing with accident. Or I wouldn't write a citation. Same thing with accidents. In a statement, City Manager James Drinkard, ooh, what a lovely last name for you, James, told CBS 46 that the traffic incident was only the latest example of Cap's insubordination. You're supposed to be a law enforcement officer, not a peacekeeper. We changed that distinction. Damn it. So while the decision to terminate employment was based in part on the former employee's decision to ignore lawful departmental policy and refuse to properly cite at-fault drivers who caused traffic crashes that resulted in property damage, that behavior was part of a pattern of performance and poor decision-making that was simply not acceptable. The city of Alpharetta makes no apology for holding our personnel responsible for properly carrying out their assigned duties, being stewards of the public trust, and advancing our mission to enhance the quality of life of our residents, businesses, and visitors. I think the quality of life of the people that this officer dealt with was enhanced because he wasn't adding to their insurance by citing them for all this shit, because you know your insurance is going to go up when that kind of shit happens. You know it is and they didn't have it on their record and you know they wound up having an okay day because nobody was hurt so there was a little bit of probably get just as much damage when you're in shopping at Walmart and someone bumps a cart into your car or opens a door into your car I think he was enhancing the quality of life for the residents and you're just being a dick James Oh, no, that's drinkard, not dickard. Excuse me. Some examples of Cap's poor decision-making include wearing earrings against dress code, stopping by his home to use the restroom instead of using public restrooms, leaving his gun unattended at a police firing range, and declining to charge a juvenile with shoplifting after she was caught stealing from a Macy's department store. 
he opted instead to hand the girl over to her parents. Now see, that's what happened when I was growing up. And trust me, we would have much rather dealt with the cop than mom and dad, because we knew what we were going to get from mom and dad when we got home. Odds are the cop was not going to make it to where we couldn't sit comfortably for a week. Mm. Further, after being reprimanded for not issuing enough tickets back in January, he asked other officers if they had an issue with the strict ticketing policy. According to official documents, the lieutenant considered it an attempt to undermine his authority and Caps was later suspended before eventually being fired. Mmm. Authorita. So, in a country where law enforcement agents are given paid vacations for killing unarmed citizens, Cap's trans transgressions seem tame by comparison. Though he is not the first police officer to be punished for attempting to be kind to the people they patrol. <sighs> no, he's not the first, but you know what? A lot of them either get fired or get forced out or they wind up Oh, expiring in an officer-involved shooting because nobody showed up for backup or the backup showed up just a little bit late. Mm. Yeah. What's that, I be Don? What you talking about? Okay, let me put this over here on the effing site as well. Do we have a popo? I think we got, yeah, we'll do this. And then we'll do that to the leeches that be. You know, those guys that demand you be a law enforcement officer, not a peacekeeper. Keep up with the change of the verbiage, damn it. Okay. Back to my pocket. I go. So, I'm going to check this one out. First, actually, this is one that, um, My dear sister Catherine, over in Ireland, posted this on Fakey Book from greenmedinfo.com. Citizens up in arms against 5G wireless technology rollout. So, are their concerns justified? Now, this is from March of this year. So, city council chambers and local officials in the U.S. are facing the outcry of residents frightened by the next generation 5G wireless communication, which by all accounts will be taking over neighborhoods soon. A resident in Montgomery County, Maryland, raised her voice to ask local officials, why can't we do a real health assessment here and find out what the real health risks are to her children and the public? So what are the risks? And more to the point, what is 5G? So 5G is fifth generation wireless system. And they are new network technologies designed to make your cell phone and similar wireless devices become super duper powerful and fast. Yeah, right. Uh-huh. It's scheduled to be deployed from 2018 and made commercially available in 2020. And we're told that 5G is expected to support at least 100 billion devices and up to 100 times faster than current 4G technology. So, one thing I did find out though, you know, and this is from uh, someone where I get my cell phone service, that uh, you get, you know, they used to do those things where you got charged extra to be able to text to each other. You know that texts just piggyback on the other stuff. So it's not like it took up any kind of extra bandwidth. It was just another way to bill you. And this is pretty much, you know, they're going to bill you to make you sick. <laughs> oh, wait. 
Is this involved with the medical community? Well, it is on Green Med Info. The 5G tech will employ low, yeah, 0.6 gigahertz to 3.7 gigahertz, mid 3.7 to 24 gigahertz, and high band frequencies, 24 gigahertz and higher. The high band frequencies largely consist of millimeter waves or MMWs, which is a type of electromagnetic radiation with wavelengths within 1 to 10 millimeters and frequencies ranging from 30 to 300 gigahertz. Now, I don't understand a bit of what I just said there. <laughs> so obviously, I need to do some reading. Hmm. <clears throat> but the hazards from cell phone technology, whoo. Cell phones operate essentially by sending and receiving radio frequency radiation from their antennas to a nearby cell tower. And thousands of independent studies link radio frequency radiation exposure from cell phones to a number of very serious diseases or diseases as I like to refer to them, such as cancer, infertility, cardiovascular disease, birth defects, memory problems, sleep disorders, etc., etc., etc. Now 5G technology comes with in excuse me, increased RF radiation exposure. Oh great. So if you believe that, if you believe they put a man on the moon, yeah, R.E.M. I, I heard that song the other day and it just popped back into my head. But if you believe that ancients, the ancients from the Bible and the Sumerian texts and the Kama Sutra and the and uh, um, Vishnu and uh, Chinese uh, writings and all, you know, anything from way back, you know, pre-Plato. If you believe any of that stuff about the longevity of people's lifespans, even if you believe half of it, and then you look at this stuff, we, we already are being inundated with radiation and you guys are kicking it up a notch. Thank you very little. Do we have a choice in this? Apparently not. Wonder what this shit does to all those little nanoparticles. Hmm. And yet, thought is energy thought is frequency. Can we combat this? That's that's where I wish to go. That's where my mind travels. You know, it doesn't pay attention to some of this stuff. It goes to the thought is energy. Thought is frequency. And energy and frequency are what make matter. So, that's what that's the path I'm going, but back to this article. Um these millimeter waves as used by the 5G network can transmit large amounts of data within a short period of time. But over short distances and also the other, or let's see, but over short distances and also the other big issue is that the signal is poorly transmitted through solid materials. Ah, ah. So it's going to make the atoms just vibrate so darn fast that you do realize that an atom is like 90% Nothing. <laughs> and then there's energy and frequency. Go figure. So this means that massive transmission of MMW will be needed. Oh, great. I want to stay with 4G. Thank you. That's bad enough. Many new antennas will be needed. And we are told full-scale implementation may require at least one antenna for every 10 to 12 houses in urban areas. Oh, the better to blanket you with radiation. Thank you ever so much. Also, the MIMO, or the Multiple Input, Multiple Output technology, is expected to be used massively. The MIMO technology is a wireless system that uses multiple transmitters. Hence, it is able to send and receive multi or multiple more data at once. Multiple more. <laughs> okay. That, you guys talk like me. Some 4G base stations already use MIMO technology, and standard MIMO involves 4 to 8 antenna. MIMO for 5G may involve may. Notice they keep saying may. They haven't tested any of this shit. It may involve approximately 100 antennas per cell phone tower. Great. 
That's a lot of antennas. I think we need to quit this shit before we blow the lid off this planet. You know, Mother Nature will recover. We may not. Increased transmission leads to increased capacity, so electromagnetic ra radiation levels can only increase. Yay! Can you say glow in the dark? The concern is that, given what we know about radio frequency radiation, this mandatory environmental increase in exposure to EM radiation will lead to increased health risks. A number of studies have demonstrated the detrimental health effects of the MMW frequencies used in 5G technology. Enough already. Oh, wait, an Israeli study. Oh, here we go. It was led by Dr. Yuri D. Feldman, by the way. It found that human sweat ducts act as an array of tiny helix-shaped antenna when exposed to MMWs. Borg. So, their findings suggest that human skin not only absorbs, but also amplifies the radiation from MMW networks. Just say no. A study carried <clears throat> carried out to evaluate, or actually nine apparently, to evaluate the interactions and implications of MMWs with the human body discovered that more than 90% of the transmitted power is absorbed in the epidermis and dermis layer. No. The effect of MMWs on the skin is arguably the greatest concern of these new wavelengths used by 5G technology. We might as well be looking at the possibility of increased incidence of many skin diseases and cancer in the coming years in areas where the 5G technology is deployed. <sighs> Calling the herd. And people are going, but it's 5G. Dude. Okay, make your, force yourself to have an attention span longer than a goldfish, people. Now, as for the damaging effects on the heart, a 1992 study found that the frequencies in the range of 53 to 78 gigahertz impact the heart rate variabi uh, variability in rats. And a Russian study on frogs whose skin was exposed to MMWs discovered abnormal heart rate changes or arrhythmias. And it's hazardous to the eyes. Oh, so we'll be blind, deaf, dumb, and frickin... 1979, a study carried out in Poland to evaluate the influence of millimeter radiation on light transmission through the lenses of the eye. And it was discovered that low-level MMW radiation produced lens opacity in rats, which is associated with the production of cataracts. Thanks. Want a cataract? No, I drive a Mazda. Mazda. Mm. A Japanese experiment carried out to examine the potential of 60 gigahertz millimeter waves exposure to cause acute ocular injuries, and it found that 60 gigahertz millimeter wave antennas can cause thermal injuries of varying types of levels and the thermal effects induced by millimeter waves can apparently penetrate below the surface of the eye. Great. Now, we have 180 scientists and doctors that are calling for a moratorium. Scientists are concerned. And 180 scientists and doctors from 35 countries have recommended a temporary ban on the rollout of 5G technology until its potential hazards on human health and the environment have been fully evaluated by scientists independent of the telecommunication industry. So what are the real dangers of 5G technology? Well, the short answer is we don't fully know yet. But the studies have been um, have on this area a lot of cause for concern. You know, this reminds me of what that Dr. David Keith had to say about the chemtrails. You know, the shit, that, the cloud seeding, as they put it. 
going on? Well, we really haven't done any studies on the long-term health effects on humans or the environment with this. But it's the right thing to do because global warming! Fuckers! Huh. The health hazard of most studied 3G CMDA technology shown to cause an array of detrimental health effects have not only been fully revealed yet or have not been fully revealed yet and here we are at the verge of adopting a potentially more dangerous technology. So don't you think we should fully evaluate the health effects of 5G before rolling out the technology? And let's not forget alternatives to wireless mobile technology are available. Fiber optic broadband technology is a feasible and safer alternative. A firm, I firmly believe that technology Im, or technological improvement can be obtained without jeopardizing the health of the general public. But then again, we are the general public. We are people. We are humans, a.k.a. we are non-entities, according to them. But, you know, what they don't realize, a little fly in the ointment of their little evil plan is, you know, with their whole mindset of we must have a throwaway society so that people will continue to purchase our product. If you kill off most of the people, ain't going to be nobody around to purchase your product, asshats. Mmm. Okay. Okay. Checking out the... You guys are talking about Tea Party. Cool. Yeah, that's... De yeah, Rob works. Uh, what I just posted is most definitely our strange attraction to self-destructive behaviors, choices, and incentives. Hmm. Okay, you know what? I'm just going to go to the pig. I need a chuckle. I need a chuckle. So over here on the pig, pigazette.com, come on over, say hey to Hambo and Porkus. Tell them Grammy sent you. They'll probably run away. Um, the word of the day is Heil Hog. It is a pigism. It's a proper greeting for an arrogant, loudmouth Parkland punk who seeks to goose step his way to mandatory gun confiscation. Okay, I get that. In the quotable quotes section, Karl Lagerfeld slams Me Too by saying, If you don't want your pants pulled down, join a nunnery. Oh, Karl, fuck you. That really does belittle those that have had that forced upon them. So, fuck you. That is not the answer, Carl. It's just like over on Minds, there was uh, someone that shared a meme that said apparently only certain, you know, like uh, Syrian children, only their lives matter, you know, and the bombing of Syria and all that. But pay no attention to all of these children that are being killed in South Africa. And uh, some moron decided to comment on there and say if you don't like the way it is move oh fuck me running dude seriously okay so yeah i'm going oi oh they have a tribute to uh r lee emery over here on the pig so if you are wishing to Check that out. They also have a tribute to Art Bell. Um, let's see. Okay. Quite a few things over here. Okay, so in this date in history, or on this date in history, the 18th of April, 1906, a civic-minded Mother Nature decides to try her hand at urban renewal. She thrills the socks off of San Francisco denizens with an 8.3 earthquake. That's why you can't have nice things. And 
Lastly, the 18th of April, 1942, Flyboy James Doolittle and his cohorts deliver a heartfelt response to Pearl Har Harbor. Um, their explosive calling card, the bombing of Tokyo, thrills Hirohito spitless. Hmm. So, they got all kinds of way cool stuff um, going on over here. I don't know that they have updated the, uh, or maybe they, okay, April 1st isn't the only day of the year when people say and do things that test our credulity. Oh, so, apparently all month of April they're going to have all kinds of fun little April Fools on you going on in their, uh, top story over here on the pig. So come on over and check it out. Now, let's get to this one. This is from the tls.co.uk or the Times Literary Supplement. It's a leading international weekly for literary culture. I saw the headline and went, ah, oh. So, what is an empath? You know, there's an awful lot of people that are going around saying, I'm an empath, I'm empathic. Are you? Well, <clears throat> the images seem so seductive. Reproduced in striking colors, they show our brains in action, regions lighting up as our thoughts and emotions fluctuate. So here's an angry brain, and then there's one bent on seduction. And compare these two, the brain of someone blessed with a strong em empathy instinct, and a psychopathic brain whose empathy circuits remain dark and unilluminated, even when confronted with sights one might assume would melt the coldest of hearts. So what wonders modern functional magnetic resonance imagery can reveal? So why can we watch a, in real time as someone's brain morphs from one state to another? Well, our Victorian forebears were entranced by the old pseudoscience of phrenology, which extrapolated from the external lumps and bumps of the skull to reveal the character of the lay, those that lay beneath. And bene, uh, benevolent, blah, 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 blah benevolent or miserly, loving or hostile, irascible or placid. But now we have real science at our disposal, and the advances of modern imaging technology mean that we no longer have to guess what the brain is up to. Well, not all the time. So our innermost thoughts and character are on display, and via scans that lay bare, who has lots of empathy and who has none? Who lies and who's a truth teller? Whom we should trust and welcome as a friend and whom we should shy away from? Thanks to modern neuroscience. And we can begin to piece together, for example, how we might improve our society by harnessing the extraordinary positive force of empathy. I thought maybe this was going to go to the Thought Police, and it just might yet, but hey. So, since neuroscientists, psychologists, and geneticists n uh, now know which parts of the brain are specifically linked to empathy and compassion, we should be considering how we can enhance these abilities. The empathy instinct is an idea whose time has come. Harnessing this new technology, Peter uh, Bazalgette assures us that the empathy instinct would allow us to create a more civil society. Oh, here we go. This could be scary. That may seem an odd sort of promise for someone who did so much to debase popular taste through his role in developing modern reality television, television to make, um, but then returning prodigal sons are always welcome. What? Modern reality television to me. Okay, whatever. Um, he assures us that we can work with the profound insights into the human mind, 
that the mapping of our emotions using functional brain imaging has made possible and all sorts of improvements will then follow. His particular hero is the Cambridge academic Simon Baron Cohn, whose pioneering work he repeatedly draws on and praises. So what exactly is it that the fMRI scans show us about the brain? Crudely and with a lag, they measure blood flow in the brain and thus can trace levels of activity in particular regions of the brain in limited but potentially scientifically interesting ways. Remember this, limited but potentially scientifically interesting ways, but you know somebody's going to use this shit for ill gains. You know it's going to happen. The digital data that MRI machines can uh, produce can, through careful manipulation, here we go, through careful manipulation, be transformed into pictures. Uh-huh. Kind of like those pictures of the globe from space. <laughs> yeah. What, it's supposed to look more like a pear, according to Neil deGrasse Tyson, and yet, no, it's like they took a can, like a soup can, and they drew a circle. <laughs> And then they started coloring it in. It's, it's, it's perfect. Perfect. But, through careful manipulation, they can transform pictures. And those images can be produced or manipulated to appear in color. They're telling you right now. Ah, so as to highlight patterns to which we wish to draw attention. Yes manipulate things, to highlight things that we wish to draw attention to. Oh, I can't see how this could go bad at all. Few will be surprised to learn that our changing thoughts and feelings are associated with physical changes in our brains. No, duh. <coughs> Excuse me. Note well, however, that the observed patterns differ from individual to individual and from experimenter to experimenter. Oh, but that doesn't mean we can't come down with concrete. You're a psychopath because it says so in this book. Moreover, st statistical averages derived from the gross changes in brain function in large experimental groups themselves derive from simple simulated experiments that in no way capture the intricacies of everyday social situations, it presents enormous difficulties when we attempt to interpret them at the level of the individual subject. Oh, but attempt to interpret they will. Once again, what pops to mind is lost in translation. Correlations of this sort, even if they were more robust, and replicable than many of them appear to be, prove nothing about the causal process involved. But that's not going to stop them. Thought police! More seriously still, we possess no way to translate heightened activity into the contents of people's thoughts. Nor do we have the prospect of making such translations, except for in science fiction and scientism. And, as if these problems are not serious enough, if it's wrong to think that empathy or other forms of thinking, feeling, and remembering co um, come to that is localized in particular regions of the brain or is the property of individual neurons, on the contrary, it is the product of complex networks and interconnections that form in the brain as we mature. FMRI images don't allow us to see an empathy instinct or a property instinct or a justice instinct or a democratic instinct or all instincts. So, let us pretend for a moment though that we can accept Basil Geddes claim that the digital mapping of the empathy instinct. 
He then invites us to consider how differently the history of the 20th century might have been if only this new knowledge had arrived a few decades sooner. Hitler, Stalin, Mao. Between them, they liquidated over 100 million of our fellow human beings. Had we the benefit of ta today's diagnostic tools, chiefly MRI scanners, we might have seen some serious abnormalities in these three dictators' brain functions. Or not, as the case may be. And you know what? If you stop and think, those things, as vile as they were, they are lessons for us to look back on and say, we ain't going there again. Sometimes ugly is a necessity for learning. But the only, the only reason that it may be an, a necessity for learning is if you're so frickin' blind or so frickin' complacent that you refuse to either see or do anything when you see to stop that kind of stuff. So sometimes you need a hard lesson to really drill it in to let you know this is as holio behavior and you really don't want to condone it because yeah you could be on the next list first they came for so just how the existence of these images might have prevented the horrors of mass extinction is left unclear the difficulty deepens when he goes on to acknowledge the mass of the mass involvement of Germans in the killing of Jews and of Turks in the massacre of Armenians and um, on the account he offers in his remainder of his book we all possess the empathy instinct to a greater or lesser degree and it is this instinct which underlies our ability to counter religious conflict and racism or um, decent health and social care, effective and humane criminal justice, and human rights more generally. All those Germans and Turks must have misplaced their empathy instinct temporarily, allowing a civilized society to behave collectively in such a barbarous fashion. In other words, turn a blind eye. Unblushingly, this is the intellectual move that he is making. Um, and he says, why did these terrible events occur? Whole communities switched off their empathy to do cruel things to their fellow citizens. So here we have an explanation, an instinct that can conveniently be invoked in an ad hoc and frivolous fashion to explain whatever one observes. Because whenever the evidence contradicts what the instinct theory would lead one to suggest, why, the people in question must have switched off their empathy and turned on their apathy. So where does the empathy instinct come from? From our genes, he suggests. Oh, Basil. It is a quality we inherit in varying quantities and Simon Baron Cohn is again invoking as the authority here on this occasion it is Baron Cohn's pop psychology book Zero Degrees of Empathy which claims that people with this borderline personality disorder make up 30 percent of suicides and half of those addicted to drugs sure you can make blanket statements doesn't mean that blanket don't have a hell of a lot of holes in it. These are statistics whose provenance is, to put it charitably, murky in the extreme. Baron Cohn then adds an even more far-fetched estimate that this condition is 70% heritable and 30% the result of abuse and neglect in childhood. I could see the result of abuse and neglect affecting that. I can see that part. So the solution to the nature-nurture debate relies on the event, on bluster, bad science, and speculation rather than evidence. Whether one is trying to explain schizophrenia, depression, homosexuality, or, as in this case, empathy, 
claims to have discovered genes that give rise to and shape complex human behaviors have evaporated when put to the test. So, let me see how long this, oh wow, this goes on and 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 I'm already, yeah. There's a crazy out there and he's going to give form to thought police. Well, he's not going to give form to it because they already have form. But I'm going to let you guys finish reading it if you wish to. But, mmm. It sounds like a very, very dangerous road to be traveling down. This is bad science at its worst, as far as I'm concerned. Looking for an empathy gene? I don't know that I would deny that there's one, but I know there's an awful lot of people that just flat ass do not exercise it, if it is such a thing. Okay, so, I was thinking there was one more, but maybe not. Maybe I don't have. Ah, here we go. One more, just a, just a quickie. This is from HealthyHolisticLiving.com. For those of you that are ramen noodle fans, the noodles that are linked to chronic inflammation, weight gain, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's. Mm-hmm. Instant noodles are popular go-to lunch and dinner things. What? Okay. Um. Okay, those, that's for those who are strapped for time or cash, like college students. And while you probably don't consider them health food, you may think that they're not that bad. Or at least not as bad as eating a burger and fries or a fast food burrito. In a first of its kind experiment, however, Dr. Brandon Koo of Massachusetts General Hospital may make you reconsider your love for instant noodles, assuming you have one. He used a pill-sized camera to see what happens inside your stomach and digestive tract after you eat ramen noodles. And one common, that's one common type of the instant noodles. And the results were astonishing. And there is a video here. In the video, you can see ramen noodles inside the stomach. And even after two hours, they are remarkably intact. Yummy. Much more so than the homemade ramen noodles, which uh, were used as a comparison. And this is concerning for a number of reasons. For starters, it could be putting a strain on your digestive system, which is forced to work for hours to break down these highly processed foods. Ironically, most processed food is also devoid of fiber, that it gets uh, broken down very quickly, interfering with your blood sugar levels and insulin release. And when food remains in your digestive tract for such a long time, it will also impact nutrient absorption. But in the case of processed ramen noodles, there isn't much nutrition to be had. Instead, there's a long list of additives, including toxic per, uh, preservative uh, TBHQ. And this additive will likely remain in your stomach along with the seemingly invincible noodles. And no one knows what this extended exposure time may do to your health. But common sense suggests it's not a good thing. Now, TBHQ is a byproduct of the petroleum industry and is often listed as an antioxidant. But it's important to realize it is a synthetic chemical with antioxidant properties, not a natural antioxidant. The chemical pre prevents oxidation of fats and oils, thereby extending the shelf life of processed foods. Depends on how you use the wordage. Words have power. It's commonly used ingredient in processed foods of all kinds, including McDonald's chicken nuggets, Kellogg's cheese it crackers, Reese's peanut butter cups, wheat thin crackers, Teddy Graham's Red Baron frozen pizza, Taco Bell beans, and much, much more. But 
You can also find it in varnishes, lacquers, and pesticide products, as well as cosmetics and perfumes to reduce the evaporation rate and improve stability. Yay, you're eating this, peeps. And in the it's um, at its 19th and 21st meetings, the joint FAO-WHO Expert Committee on Food Additives determined that TBHQ was safe for human consumption at levels of 0 to 0 0.5 uh, micrograms per kilogram of body weight. However, the Codex Commission set the maximum allowable limits up to between 100 to as much as 400 milligrams or micrograms per kilogram, depending on the food it's added to. Chewing gum is permitted to contain the highest level of TBHQ. And in the U.S., the Food and Drug Administration requires that TBHQ must not exceed 0.02% of its oil and fat content. So, there's quite a discrepancy in supposed safe limits, but it's probably best to have little or no exposure to this toxicant, as exposure to 5 grams can be lethal. And according to Consumer Dictionary of Food Additives, exposure to just 1 gram of TBHQ can cause nausea and vomiting, ringing in the ears, delirium, sense of suffocation, and collapse. So... Stay away from, there's more to this, but I'm running out of time. So stay away from those damn ramen noodles. Those things are nasty, nasty, nasty. Make your own noodles if you got to have noodles. So y'all been listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair here on RealLibertyMedia.com, channel three on this wacka, 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 wacka doodle Wednesday. And I've kind of gone wacka doodle far afield on this one tonight. But please remember... Stay away from ramen noodles, exercise your empathy instinct, <laughs> and remember, I truly do love you all, and I wish you all enough. Good night. <laughs>